So good morning and good afternoon everyone and welcome to today's Range 4 webcast. Today we're going to be talking about DevOps and insurance. Um, I'm Helen Beale and I'm also joined by fellow DevOpsologist at Range 4, Ryan Dobson. Hey, hello Ryan. Hello everybody. So we're very lucky at Range 4. We count lots, um, lots and lots of insurers as um, our customers. So we're really delighted to kind of focus in on this subject today and share some of our observations from this particular vertical market or industry. Um, and hopefully help some of you along your own DevOps evolutionary journeys. So, um, as always, we're going to try and keep the agenda fairly short and sweet today. So, three main things we want to look at. We're going to look at the key drivers that are facing um, insurers today. Then we're going to spend some time looking at what leaders in the industry are doing, um, obviously particularly around DevOps, to address these digital disruptors. disruptors. And then finally, we're just going to finish off um, with some words on how Range 4 can help you move the needle on your DevOps evolution too. So first of all, let's take a quicker or a quick look at digital disruption um, and see the kind of things that are driving insurers today. So I'm going to show my age a little bit, <clears throat> but when, when I first passed my driving test, um, the way that I got insurance is I would physically uh, walk into a Swinton's store. You can see one here on the left of your screen. Um, I think a few of them still exist out there. And obviously I did wonder <clears throat> whilst preparing for this webcast, what Swinton's were doing today, and they do have a website, and it is possible um, to order things online, and they do um, still have a phone number that you can call. So Swinton's one of our classic insurer brokers that we would go to, and they would help us find some good insurance. Um, the insurance broker space has developed rapidly over the last few years, so we've got many, many um, organisations, our lovely Meerkat people, many organisations that um, have really kind of rocketed up the, this industry, have really made it um, very, very powerful, very easy to use. Um, it's also quite challenging for the insurers who have to integrate um, with all of these brokerages and make sure that they're competitive and a winning business as they get into head-on competition with each other in terms of providing policies um, for the consumers in particular um, on many different areas. And this is um, obviously much more consumer than business focused, this um, commentary in particular here. Um, other um, things that come and disrupt um, our kind of classic enterprise insurers, we've also got the supermarkets getting on the insurance bandwagon. I have been for several years. So if you um, go into any of these large supermarkets in the UK and you go up to um, the cash registers, quite often you'll see lots and lots of leaflets of all of the, the various banking and insurance services that they now offer as well. So there's lots of competition um, coming through there. Um, then we have consumers accessing things in different ways. So as we said earlier, gone are the days that I walk into a, a Swinton's on the high street and ask for some help buying some car insurance. Um, I can do it on the train now on my phone. There's all these different apps out there. So some of these big brokers that we looked at have their own applications. There's some other not so well known on the internet that have their own um, apps to help people buy insurance than some of the big insurers like uh, Aviva um, also have apps where you can manage your insurance online and in fact they're doing even more than that so we see here uh, one of the um, applications of the mobile technology in terms of being able to record your journeys and then um, achieve savings on your car insurance based on being um, a good and safe driver. Um, so lots of different ways here lots of um, competition again uh, between the insurers to to get different insurances out there. Lots of other apps that are being offered by the insurers today on our smartphones as well. So um, here we have quite a few from Hiscox, There's quite a few available on the App Store. Um, and I'm an iPhone user, so I'm mainly on the App Store. Um, so here they have a magazine and then they have um, some internal applications as well for sales coaching and management coaching. Um, this is like a magazine one and Saga, um, they also have their magazine available electronically um, as an app. LV are offering a game here, you can see, called Drift um, as an app. Um, and here you can see Aviva again, and Aviva again taking things one step further and allowing you to do um, actual claims on your phone. So if you have an incident, you can immediately from um, from the outside using the telecoms network is report that without having to um, phone people and uh, such like. And you can also start doing things like uh, taking photos and that sort of thing and attaching those to your claim. We've also got I IoT, so the Internet of Things causing some challenges. So this is a, a Canary Home Security 
um, appliance and there's a, a few of these different ones around so there's some nest cameras as well so it is uh, iot is you know particularly in the home we're becoming more connected there's more and more applications um, that can help us um, either uh, lower our policies around insurance if we in the same way that um, having a burglary alarm for example can often um, reduce our insurance and having certain types of lock um, this can also help um, more and more things going on in the car. So again, um, data being collected um, from the driver here um, that can be used with the insurer to, to give them more information on that um, particular driver's capability. Um, and then some insurers, so here's something from Vitality um, that rewards you for being healthy. So Vitality play hard on this, this idea. And actually, I think you, they give away Apple Watches and things um, when you sign up often. And here are a couple of examples of those internet of things so the the fitbit um, and the apple watch of course both collecting data on on how fit and healthy we are and our health assurance insurance policies um, and premiums accordingly can be can reflect our ability to look after ourselves and maintain our our fitness uh, here's another example of this so um, again the apple watch slightly differently this time not about health this time but again back to uh, what we were just talking about a moment ago with the um, with the Aviva Drive app, um, again, AXA um, using the Apple Watch to collect data on the driver's capabilities and um, behaviours and accordingly rewarding them in their policies or perhaps even punishing them. Um, so this chart is from uh, a Deloitte's report, uh, which is linked in the slides accompanying this webcast. So uh, we can hear, see here nine killer applications of digital technology. Um, in general insurance, which is what we're really focusing on today. So we've touched on a few of these already. We've looked at price comparison websites. We've looked at mobile internet um, transactions um, and value comparison websites. There's a few more of interest in here. I was particularly interested to see this one up here. So um, it's going to have a high impact, but in the longer term. So what are we going to do when we get more and more self-driving cars out there? How is that going to work? How are they going to be insured? Uh, Ryan, have you got any comments on any of the other bubbles on here at this point? Yeah, I think the one that interests me most is the tele telematics based services. So it, it's like um, we've been just discussing quite a bit. It's um, sort of insurance based on usage. Um, so again, that can that can be your, your watch, it that can be your black box in your cars. Obviously, a lot of uh, a lot of insurance doing that, but it's it's actually paying for. Um, something that you use, which I think is probably the biggest thing to come out of um, sort of insurance in the last few years. Um, so that I, I think the ability to offer that obviously comes down to your ability to um, innovate in technology as well. So um, the self-driving car, very interesting. I'm not sure exactly how that will work. Um, you know, so the telematics you... stuff is interesting, isn't it? And I didn't highlight it on the mobile apps a minute ago, but there was one of those that was offering insurance by the hour, car insurance by the hour, or motor insurance. So <laughs> kind of pay-as-you-go utility insurance. It's a really interesting concept, not one that I've personally used yet. Yeah, and, and I was also reading something um, a little bit earlier about tying in sort of your usage of car insurance with your um, gas and electric, you know, the big insurance that can offer everything. You can bundle it all together. So, yeah, in interesting, interesting stuff. Okay. Um, so another report out there, again, linked in the slides that accompany the webcast. So this is from the Harvey Nash KPMG CIO survey in 2016. Um, it's the largest, largest IT leadership study in the world with um, well over 3,000 respondents across an enormous amount of countries and a rather huge amount of IT budget spend under consideration there. So uh, 200 billion US dollars a budget spend um, with the people answering this. Um, so here we can see um, people's answers about uh, digital disruption. So the first chart is around um, whether the organisation has a clear digital business vision and strategy. Um, and we've got a, a reasonable amount, 37% saying yes, enterprise-wide, um, but some catching up to do um, there. Um, Ryan, did you have any particular observations on the, the second chart, this bar chart here, about um, where the primary sources of disruption are coming from? Yeah, well, I had a little um, sort of review of it a little bit earlier. Um, you know, I think what's most engaging, what's, um, what is most important to look at is the 
sort of customer engagement um because obviously in devops you're looking to to work towards and innovate according to customer need and customer feedback um so i think that's a real um good sign um you know more customer engagement what's really um, interesting about that as well is where the red diamond is here so that obviously is the all industries average so um, insurance, and we'll come to this again a bit later. Not always seen as the <clears throat> the big leaders in industry, but um, are quite significantly ahead of the industry average in terms of um, at least recognising customer engagement as being a, a major disruptor. Yeah, and, and I think what's what's also interesting to note, um, staying on the same sort of topic, the second one down, new innovative products. You can see the um, cross industry average a lot higher. Um, insurance is obviously up there and it, it seems to be catching up but how many different innovative products can you have with insurance this is the thing I suppose the the uh, smart watches and, and black boxes and things can um, improve that but, um, but yeah interesting yeah it's surprising they're a little bit behind given what we've just seen there and then the primary method for coping with digital disruption um, with your background um, in DevOps recruitment is this interesting here that the primary way of, of coping is just grabbing more people? I think so, and I think it's a misdemeanor sometimes. I think, um, especially in Devo in the DevOps world, you know, it has been such a buzzword for, so, um, for a few years now. People looking out into the market thinking, right, we need to DevOpsify, how do we do this? Bringing a, a, a sort of a few contractors to build up a, an automation pipeline tooling, but you know, as we all know, it doesn't doesn't quite work as easy that way. Um, but yeah, it, it is interesting. That's that's a lot higher than um, industry average. I wonder why that is. I'm not too sure why. So let's have a look at what the leaders are doing in the insurance space. So first of all, I did mention we probably have a little think about this a moment uh, ago. So you've probably seen this before. This bell curve about. Um, when people adopt technology and different types of people or organizations. So um, we've got innovators here, then we've got early adopters, then we've got this chasm that often happens. So I think um, this year in particular, I've seen so many articles, particularly right at the start of the year when people were doing forecasts and predictions for the year ahead, um, particularly around DevOps becoming mainstream this year. So um, DevOps very much over the chasm um, and into this space now. Now, um, Typically, Ryan, where would you say we would plot insurers as a as a group on this um, on Jeffrey Moore's chart? Typically, it depends whether you're looking at the new insurers on the market or the well-established ones. Um, um, tough to say, sort of put me on the spot here. I would have said <laughs> typically. I think we've always put um, insurance as a bit of a a bit later, late majority here, but as you say, there are lots of people breaking the model. So we've seen um, the go compares the money supermarket dot coms, and those there's kind of some of them could even be put over here in terms of um, digital innovation. So let's have a look um, again back at this Harvey Nash and KPMG CIO survey. Um, so this is kind of good news in that. We seem to have come out of the recession um, and most people are seeing either the same or an increase in their budget and quite a, quite a lot of people seeing an increase, which is great. Um, not so many people seeing a decrease, but still quite a sizable number. Um, these people that are staying the same, though, they're going to be asked um, about doing more with less or doing more with the same for sure. So a lot of what we're doing in DevOps, and we'll come back to this again later, is trying to increase capacity. The one I've got on here, though, with the big green arrow um, is under this question, what steps are you taking to become more agile and responsive? And 38%, which again is over the industry average, um, said they're doing DevOps. Um, does that surprise you, Ryan, from your experiences out in the field, that many people doing DevOps? It does. It surprised me, especially a lot higher than industry average. Um you know, implementing agile methodologies, that's that's no big surprise there. But yeah, specifically DevOps, um, that's only obviously gonna gonna grow and grow. Um, I think as I said, what what strikes me most is that it's actually above industry average. But you know, 
Range of Four, we work with a, a lot of insurance companies, and it, it does seem to be the norm, especially even this year in 2017, a lot more um, sort of financial and, and especially insurance based companies are looking to take that step into DevOps or are looking to improve their DevOps capabilities. You know, there's been a lot of companies that we know that have tried it, have, have you know, as we see earlier, taken on a few contractors per se or hired in the DevOps area but not quite got going. Um, and I think that's that's only growing as, as, as months go on. So it is a good sign. Yeah, I think that's a really salient point that you make that I I'm kind of surprised, part of me is surprised that it's higher than average, but it's still less than half of them. And I think even with the, the, a lot of the insurers we've been working closely with, they're still quite early um, in their DevOps evolution. Um, and as you say, there's kind of, we often see this kind of stuttering start where they kind of try and make changes and then other things happen that, that slow them back down again. So again, um, cloud, um, very closely linked to, to DevOps. I should probably have removed that arrow. I actually shouldn't be there. Um, but let's have a think about cloud. Um, reasons for using cloud technology. So the top one um, about um, agility and responsiveness, which is great. We'll come back to cloud again um, a bit later on and, and with a, a real case study about it and then talking about how to talk um, to your board and CFO and, and colleagues about why you might want to go cloud. Again, interesting how insurance on these first three on the bar chart um, is streaking ahead. Um, and interesting here how the one of those five metrics um, that they're lagging behind on is about the improvement, availability and resiliency. Um, I suspect that has something to do with the fact that they've already put quite a lot of effort into those areas um, as, as they've built out some of their digital expertise. What do you think? Yeah, I, just on sort of first glance, I can just imagine that it's not, um, they don't necessarily get peaks and troughs as, as you know, when it comes to availability um, in relation to other industries. What what does not surprise me as such, but it's, it's funny to see that insurers quite um, important to them is, is saving money, um, quite a bit higher than industry, industry average. Um, yeah. So let's take a look at some case studies. So again, um, you'll find the links to the original articles um, in all of your slide packs. So um, Aviva, obviously a very large insurer in the UK, um, and this was actually from 2015, um, late in 2015, so um, sort of just over 12 months ago, about their plans for clouds. So this is Mark Hall, the Director of IT Operations, um, talking there. And putting cloud absolutely the heart of their business strategy. And I think that's really important that it's not that cloud is at the heart of their IT strategy. It's, heart, it's at the heart of the business strategy. Um, and that was really about giving them the ability to move and be agile. Um, and they have this ambition um, really to set themselves up as the um, digital first insurer, so the digital insurer. Um, I found this comment that, that Mark Rip made um, really incisive. So when I stood in front of our chief executive and the board and said, I think this is the right thing to do, it wasn't a case of, are you sure? It was a case of, here's the evidence. And that's really powerful that he had already early on managed to collect metrics and data um, to build trust and prove his points there. Um, what do you think of the benefits here that Mark experienced, Ryan? I think it's quite a common thing that we see across all um, businesses and obviously insurance um, when, when they're moving to the cloud and especially sort of DevOps. I think as you'll see in one of your future slides, um, some facts around nationwide. Um, you know, it's, it, it seems to be um, quite quite an obvious thing to, to just think why, why is every, everyone not going DevOps to, to see these benefits? But obviously, it comes down to the fact of the ease of doing it. Um, but you know, just, just by seeing these, it, it'd be interesting to see actually how um, what measurements are used actually to present back to the business, and how he how he did sort of set these KPIs and, and metrics in place to to show these these savings. Um, but yeah, really good numbers. Yeah, and I think it's very interesting that he does talk about everything being kind of cheaper here because that really wasn't 
um, an, an original, an original um, driver. It was really about becoming more um, agile and being more capable of delivering innovation to their users. But the the cost benefits came kind of behind um, all of that. And I think it's worth having a conversation. I think you just touched on it then about what's stopping people doing this? What's stopping people, for example, making a, a move to the cloud, which releases a, a lot of innovative capability? And for some people in insurance, that has been around um, uncertainty about things like data. So insurers obviously carry masses of consumer data and business data that's very, very sensitive. So they need to be absolutely sure that that data is going to be segregated and protected um, in all of the right ways. And I think the, the big cloud providers have done some really good work in the past few years on showing um, how that's possible and um, also complying with the way that laws change in different locales also. So um, nationwide, this is an article from um, DevOps.com. If we drill down, um, again, the links are in the presentation. If we drill down um, into a bit more detail, um, Ryan, talk us through Carmen's story here. Yeah, so Carmen is uh, one of the directors of application um, development at Nationwide. So I was reading one of his interviews um, a little bit earlier. Um, and as you see there, some of the benefits that they actually gained from going DevOps, um, very similar, 50% improvement in code quality, 70% reduction in system downtime. But I think what was important to to know and what I pulled from um, some of the answers he gave um, were he basically he said what one of the most important um, important changes that he, he started to implement was by investing time into um, setting up a continuous delivery and, and sort of continuous deployment capability it actually gave the business in turn a chance to be a little bit more um, continuous planning. It actually gave them that ability to be a bit more continuous flow, continuous planning, and, and start to drip feed them projects instead of a typical one dump once a year and let IT get on with it. So what he was actually saying was by the, by the improvements in the IT translated back in the business, and now it's a, it's a continual flow of, if we go and look at the, the three ways of DevOps, it's, it's that sort of improving the flow and then improving the, the feedback loop as well. Um, so yeah, really, really good stuff. Also, um, he was actually asked the question, if you could go back and start your, your DevOps journey again, what would you have done differently? Um, and one of, the, one of the things that he did say was having taken the time to understand the entire delivery chain um, would have saved them uh, an abundance of, of time um, originally and allowed them to make more holistic improvements and to avoid some of the pitfalls um, of, of some of the changes they tried to make. Obviously they did learn from, from the mistakes but he said if he had taken the time to take that high level view and to understand the full end to end process from the start um, it would have allowed them to make a much more um, iterative approach um, from day one. And it's great you, you mentioned the three ways and flow there, because I guess what he's saying is he really wanted to get a view of that entire value stream. Um, he probably just looked at kind of one part of his overall kind of tapestry or ecosystem and then realised the, the amount of connections and dependencies across it all. Um, yeah, and it's great yeah. you mentioned the three ways. There's a couple of other points I, I wanted to pull out here. One of, around CALMS, obviously um, CALMS is our like elevator acronym in DevOps. So um, culture was actually mentioned on the slide earlier. Um, uh, from Aviva um, and culture is very important we're talking about automation here we've talked about flow which is lean already and then Carmen's also talking about measurement so he says he's moved 58% of the teams into the top quartile in key productivity measures um, we don't have all the detail on what those key productivity measures are but they really do sound like metrics that, that matter so um, real savings um, and value that can be explained um, to the business and then the other thing I wanted to pull out was this um, statement here about by balancing speed, co cost, quality and risk, DevOps is helping us to increase our capacity to innovate. So they kind of have this um, output by balancing all those things, which brings me on to um, the, this is a little bit of a joke, everyone, but um, there's a, the link on this slide will take you to this discussion 
um, we were having about a particular DevOps article that we posted on social media. Um, and the lovely Magnus Hedmark um, kind of started talking about how DevOps breaks the iron triangle. So um, you'll be familiar probably with the iron triangle. So this idea that um, we can't have three things at once, as in we can't have low cost, we can't have high speed and high quality. We always have to compromise one of those things. Um, and what DevOps is really saying is with DevOps, you can have it all. You can um, do things at low cost, very fast um, and at very high quality. And actually, we've got this Beale Headmark Golden Square because what we decided was there's actually a fourth thing that we get out of all of this. So um, DevOps is saying, yeah, we can do things at lowest cost. We can do them really fast. We can make sure they're really high quality and we can really delight our users and our consumers of our products and services um, at the same time. So um, another case story here. So this time Allstate, a very large uh, insurer again in the in the States. Um, here this is Oprah Perrys, who's the division or CIO of, of claims. Um, again, um, the benefits, that just we concentrate in the little snippet over here, the benefits of DevOps are often portrayed in terms of how they improve IT. But at Allstate, DevOps automation has made everyone more productive. So that really harks back to what you were saying, Ryan, about Carmen's comment that, they went agile and the business followed them and became agile too. Yeah, exactly that. Because I think along the process of the DevOps journey, what they realized was that, you know, one of the biggest setbacks they were having were, were, was having the, the business, um, you know, chuck them over a, a whole bunch of, um, or, or filling up the sort of backlog of, of work. Um, which obviously drips down in, into IT and, and, and affects their agile way of working. But what they're saying was the more they improve their agile capabilities, the more that allowed the business to, to improve their ways of, of um, drip feeding um, products and projects into the pipeline. So, yeah, interesting to see that it's a, it's a similar statement. And I love this focus on values and end goals, and we'll come back to that in just a few moments. Um, so Hiscox, um, again, in 2015, um, quite early on in 2015, they won a very prestigious award from Celent um, for their continuous delivery pipeline. Um, the link um, is again on the slide. And the story in terms of the business benefits from it is just massive. So, you know, this is such a great business metric that really, really matters, an increase in sales, a 20% increase in sales in the first week of delivering um, this new application via this new um, continuous delivery pipeline doubled the conversion of policy applications again a business metric being reported by it um, very key getting the single view of the customer so this is a real common problem again amongst insurers um, having single customers with multiple insurance policies um, that are siloed in different areas um, reduction in the release cycle from 10 weeks to two weeks huge drop in the volume of defects coming through Release time reduced from three hours to just six minutes. So thousands and thousands of percentage savings there. Um, and the average cost savings of automated deployment of £7,000 per week. So that's, um, you know, half a million dollars per year just from uh, the automated deployment piece alone there. And as um, his works will tell you, they simply couldn't have done this um, with people. There had to be some automation behind it um, to allow for these step changes. So I love this quote from um, the DevOps Handbook. Um, hopefully some of you have got your hands on this already. It came out in October last year, um, published by IT Revolution, um, the press that also published Phoenix Project, and also written by Gene Kim, along with the godfather of DevOps, Patrick Tuar, and John Willis, um, another great originator of the DevOps thinking. Um, and um, but, and uh, th this quote in particular is, is, oh, sorry, the, and also Jess Humble, of course, um, the writer of Lean Enterprise and Continuous Delivery. But I love this quote because it's we use it actually in our DevOps Foundation course and it, it really helps us if we break it down. It looks like a lot of words to begin with, but it really helps us kind of break down um, what the capabilities are that we need. So these um, getting these market-oriented outcomes, which is, really again, really important. So um, understanding the metrics we really want to use. Um, having these centralised platforms, tooling services, which is uh, quite often a bit of an emotional discussion. But um, here we have a really good description on, in terms of what we're looking for in a DevOps tool chain. Um, so just to spend a couple of minutes um, um, that we have left on how we can help. So 
insurers do have some things that make them unique or we do see some patterns in insurance that mean that um, the DevOps advice for insurers is slightly different. So one of the things we see a lot is this need to consolidate platforms. So a lot of insurers have far too many platforms which are fragmented. It makes it, makes it really hard um, to keep up with change if it's if there's a lot of dependencies and a lot of fragility into the system. Um, and again, the, in the moment, we'll look at the kind of things that if you're writing a business case to do DevOps, one of them is about um, the risk of competed, being competed out. Another thing that we see is this desire um, for insurers to have um, basically uh, IT as an innovator. And Robert Hiscox, who um, was the originator or the founder of, of Hiscox, did say that he saw Hiscox as a technology business, not an insurance business anymore. So he really had put IT up front and centre. Um, Joanne Molsky, the co-author of uh, Lean Enterprise, actually with Jess Humble, she was on stage at the DevOps Enterprise Summit last year, and she said this, it's not about IT aligning with the business anymore. It's not even about IT integrating with the business. It's about IT being, it is the business. And kind of us loosening this distinction between these two areas and actually integrating or um, having IT so seamlessly and flawlessly moving with what the business needs that it's not seen as any kind of separate entity. Um, we looked at this earlier. And we looked at some of the uh, Harvey Nash KPMG slides. So, um, yes, everyone's on an agile journey, but how well are you doing it? How well is it being pushed across the whole organization? And as Ryan pointed out, um, with Nationwide, um, IT often lead the way in terms of teaching business how to deliver requirements in an agile manner, deliver funding um, in an agile manner. Um, this idea, again, and this is, these two are really closely linked, IT being an innovator and measuring IT value, because IT needs to be able to report to the business in words that make sense to the business. So as we just looked at with those metrics from Hiscox, um, real business winning metrics, so sales increasing, profit increasing, shareholder value increasing, numbers of clients, um, all of those kind of things. Um, the cloud is there. Insurers are moving towards it quite slowly, I would suggest. Um, and we make this advice here about don't look to it primarily for productivity savings, but look at it as underpinning your ability to operate as a digital business and deliver innovation at speed. And then kind of harking back to Ryan's three ways again, this focus on the flow. So um, how can you optimise this? If you are an enterprise that has been around for a while, you have probably got quite a lot of waste that... Um, you would do well to look at removing. So um, kind of closely linked to these things, the benefits, um, being able to report on value, being able to, so harking back to that pie chart we saw earlier about budgets and whether you've got more budget or less budget or the same budget, um, how can we help you build more capacity into your organisation without increasing your IT budget and without hiring more people? How can you use that capacity to produce greater business value? Um, rework is a really big one in insurance as well, because there tends to be quite a lot of technical and cultural debt in organisations that have been around for a while. So how can we remove that and focus your time primarily on delivering things that add more value? Then um, competitive risk that I've touched on quite a lot. So um, this is a really disrupted industry. There are threats coming from all over the place. Um, the more people can automate quoting mechanisms and underwriting and policy admin and all of these things, um, the more um, people's lunch gets eaten. Um, another really good case um, around uh, DevOps benefits um, or when you're writing a business case is around this downtime as well. So um, measuring downtime in terms of real business value is very important. So being able to say, that system went down and unfortunately that meant that we didn't get those 1,000 policies that would have been signed up for in that hour um, and therefore it cost us X amount. Again, it's really powerful to be able to report um, that and uh, particularly when you're trying to change that and say, look, um, if we have better monitoring systems, for example, or better resilience in the cloud, that will save us this amount of money. And then talking about flow again, going lean, how much waste is there in your value stream? How do we remove that, that waste and what does that mean? Um, in terms of being able to operate faster. Um, for example, here we often do value stream mapping with customers. Um, Aviva did one um, and they saved about 80% in um, just uh, the issuing of um, a, a particular pension type policy just because there, were, there was so much particular waste in that value stream. So 
How can we help? Um, we can help by doing things like value stream mapping. We can assess where you currently are and help you build your evolutionary plan to move forward. And we can help you um, change your culture um, as you move forward. Um, we really believe that change comes from within at Range of Four. So all of our DevOps evolution tools are really built to help you make change with your people and your systems. Um, we don't really aim to come in um, and kind of send 20 consultants in for six months um, to build something and then walk away. That's not really our style. Um, Ryan, just to finish us off today, what other ways in which um, we can help? So there's a lot of obviously core services that Range of Four um, provides. Some of the, one of the um, main things that we've been doing with a, a lot of customers at the moment is the Phoenix Project game, um, which if anyone's seen or has anyone read the book will, will understand um, sort of the basics of it. Um, it's, it's a day's day's training, um, but it's geared towards uh, a understanding of the DevOps principles, processes, methodologies um, of up to 12 to 15 people. Um, it actually runs as if you're, you're walking through the book. Um, so there's there's series of positions, CIO through to application development infrastructure. Um, everyone takes on um, a position from the book. And it's, it's a way that the team can live through and learn the DevOps processes um, as they would in, in typical life. Um, so as well as sort of learning and, and reading books, it, it's a way to actually sort of see how it how it's run um, in a real life scenario. Um, we also obviously do a lot of DevOps training courses from the DevOps Institute. So Helen sits on the Board of Regents, um, or Ranger Force sits on the Board of Regents with, with Gene Kim. Um, so there's a series of DevOps practitioner courses, um, which include DevOps Foundation, um, Agile Service Management, um, DevSecOps engineer, Dev, DevOps test engineers, and continuous delivery architects. So there's a, a, a wide range of education, um, training, and, and classes that we, we provide. Um, so we are um, one of the key things that we're actually um, doing at the moment with a lot of customers is, is combining both the training and the, the Phoenix Project uh, DevOps simulation together, um, proving to be a, a, a very impressive way of, of spreading the um, understanding of the DevOps for a wider business. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll obviously follow up with, with everyone following the webcast if there is anything else we, we can help with. Um, or if there's anything that you just want to chat and, and get some, some advice and, and help with, then just get in touch. Thanks, Ryan. So we have run slightly over today, so apologies for that to everyone. Um, we do have a couple of questions, though, so I think we'll take some time to answer them. So um, first of all, we have a question from Chris, which is how do you see storage of data and processing in cloud environment across co-location data centers changing with Brexit heading our way? Um, really, um, really, really good question. Um, I think the short answer is we don't know yet. Um, the longer answer is that we know um, of some change in data protection laws. So you might be familiar with GDPR. Um, Ryan just mentioned the game, actually, which is it's quite a, a good question and good timing. Um, we ran a game just very recently at the RSPB. Um, they were pulling together a new team to help them address GDPR, um, which is the general, general uh, data privacy regulation coming out of the EU. Um, we're not expecting that to change with Brexit. I think um, changes to our data laws are probably going to take a very long time and we might not want to make them that different to what's coming out of, of the rest of Europe anyway. Um, but I think, like the RSPB, uh, many insurers will be looking closely at GDPR at the moment and trying to understand um, how the way that they operate now needs to change and how any other considerations they need to make of the way that they handle consumer data, the way that they have processes um, that work um, in the unfortunate uh, incident of any kind of hack or any kind of um, breach around data. So um, certainly pick that up and have more conversation with you, with you Chris. But um, GDPR is the big one at the moment. I'm not really expecting Brexit to, to take GDPR away anytime soon. Um, and another question from Paul. Do insurers view their legacy systems as inhibitors for undertaking a DevOps initiative? Um, again, really good question. And, and actually, if we've kind of go back to that, um, I'll just flip back a couple of slides. 
Oh, no, I've come out completely. I didn't mean to do that. Let me just uh, run down here quickly. So um, this slide I was thinking of, that that top left one, this one, platform consolidation, um, this is what we're seeing a lot of, and that is people seeing legacy systems as an inhibitor. Um, not necessarily, they would not necessarily articulate it as an inhibitor for undertaking a DevOps initiative, but they would certainly see it as an inhibitor for um, being able to be um, agile. So uh, systems that are very, very complicated, very fragmented and very fragile, um, also very monolithic, do not allow for people to um, very quickly move and adapt as they are disrupted by competitors. So um, this is why this is uh, probably the, the number one thing that we're seeing um, with the insurance companies that we uh, are working with at the moment, this um, replatforming, um, driving the ability to move fast. So um, that was the couple of questions we had today. So thanks very much, Chris and Paul, both of you for those. And thank you, Ryan, for um, your input and your wisdom in today's webcast. Um, as Ryan said, we will be following up with all of you. So uh, we look forward to, to speaking with you again soon. Thank you very much, Ryan. And thank you, everybody. Thank for you, Ryan. Bye bye thanks. for now. Bye.